Welcome, good morning. Uh, welcome to this webinar, uh, which is entitled Europe's Green Transition, uh, Opportunities and Barriers for EU-Norway Cooperation. Uh, this event is part of a series called NUPI Climate and Energy Seminars, organized by the Climate and uh, Energy Research Group here at the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. It is also organized uh, as part of a project, a research project called uh, Norway and the EU Towards 2030, which looks at uh, climate, of course, um, security, health preparedness, as well as rule of law issues. Um, today, we will talk about uh, Europe's vision of a green transition and Norway's potential role in it. Well, Norway is not a member state of the European Union. However, it is certainly one of the closest, if not the closest uh, external uh, partner for in, in, in many areas and its uh, laws and legal regulations are very often um, made compatible with the European Union uh, very quickly. Um, well, as you probably know, we are going through a well, very, very um, tough times right now and the area of energy as well as climate policy is touched uh, by this very much. Uh, the European Commission launched the European Green Deal initiative in December 2019. A lot has happened since then. I mean, we went through, or we're still going through, uh, a pandemic which had severe social economic implications. And once we thought that we were finally um, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, um, a war uh, happened in, in Europe's nearest neighborhood. Uh, <clears throat> well, interestingly, the European Union and Norway um, published uh, something, a document called the EU-Norway Green Alliance that was announced on the 23rd of February this year. And of course, the next day on the 24th of February, as many of you will know, um, events in Ukraine and in Russia's invasion of Ukraine have made this Norwegian EU initiative something that well, was not necessarily um, newsworthy priority. However, um, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed the context of Europe's uh, um, climate policy, but it has not derailed the visions for a green vision, uh, for a green transition. Um, and this is something we would like to discuss today. Um, what is the current vision for the European Union? What does the Commission uh, see it uh, as, well as, as its priorities? And how can Norway contribute there? Uh, is it merely um, well the safest and kind of the most democratically stable? I would like to apologize to any American friends here. Um, source of hydrocarbons for Europe, or does it also have a role to play in in other areas? And we're really happy to have three fantastic experts here today. We have uh, Fabien Porcher from uh, DG Clima European Commission. Uh, we have Olaf Berg from uh, the European Free Trade Association uh, Secretariat, EFTA, and we have Catherine Banet from the University uh, of Oslo. Uh, we'll start in this, or we'll go in this order, and uh, Fabien uh, will first um, introduce the, well, the perspective of the Commission, just a short introduction of, of you, Fabien, before you start. Fabien is a policy officer in charge of climate diplomacy and bilateral relations at the European Commission, uh, DG Climate Action, so Director General of Climate Action. He is an experienced administrator uh, with many years of, uh, well, have, having worked for many years in different EU institutions. Before joining the Commission, he was working on environmental issues at the European Economic and Social Committee. So, a fantastic expert. And, well, Fabian, the, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Kasper. Uh, good morning, everyone. A pleasure to be with you. Greetings from Brussels. Um, indeed, uh, thanks for introducing me, Casper. Um, uh, I, um, I work for the European Commission's uh, Director General for Climate and in particular uh, the uh, international relations uh, team where I um, oversee a number of uh, countries, including, uh, including Norway. So my pleasure to be uh, to be here uh, with you this morning to address this very uh, all-encompassing uh, issue of the let's say green transition in a very uh, in a very wide uh, in a very wide meaning and the role uh, challenges and opportunities for a country like uh, like Norway in it. Um, you rightly recalled that the that the European Commission launched this uh, European Green Deal in 2019. Um, at the very beginning, 
uh, I think 10 days after the beginning of uh, this uh, this term, 2019-2024, it is the number one priority of this uh, of this commission, and uh, it has been made extremely clear. It is basically a 360 degree um, initiative uh, for for a new type of growth, for a new type of prosperity that encompasses climate for sure but not just uh, not just climate it has climate neutrality by 2050 at its core uh, but it, al it also goes into uh, industry it also goes into uh, circularity how circular our economy is how biodiversity friendly our economy is uh, it goes into finance and it goes into international and diplomacy uh, so Yes, of course, climate uh, neutrality is the central element to it because the European Green Deal, in essence, is the European uh, reply, so to say, uh, to the uh, to the Paris Agreement. But it also goes beyond and taps into all the potential areas for um, for achieving this um, um, this goal. And it does have, of course, a global effect because we think that climate neutrality will be the pace setter for reshaping the world's economy, driving markets um, into one very clear uh, direction. Um, the EU was uh, pioneering this. I think we were the first area of the world actually choosing to go climate neutral by a date certain um, back in 20, actually 2018. Um, but we're obviously very glad to see that uh, an increasing number of countries uh, are following suit, uh, following um, uh, our example, so, so, so to speak. And this is, uh, as my boss, Franz Timmermans, the executive vice president of the Commission for the Green Deal, usually says, this is a this is a race we're happy to lose. If 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 somebody is better uh, is better at it than than us, we'll be only uh, happier. In order to make this climate neutrality objective by 2050 possible. Um, the, the one thing uh, that we really need to work on is the mid-term uh, target, the medium-term target, which, which is 2030. Um, until now, it was uh, minus, at least minus 40%. Now, it it is, as you probably know, uh, shifting up uh, to minus at least minus 55% compared to, uh, compared to 1990. And this is um, only a number, but this is actually a lot and a lot of work um, uh, behind it. Um, this this double target, uh, climate neutral by uh, 2050 and minus 55 by uh, 2030, were made um, were, were basically en encapsulated into EU law with the European Climate Law, the first one, uh, European Climate Law that was that entered into force in April um, in April last year. So this basically means that there is no going back. This is the direction we're taking uh, and, 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 and that's it. And, um, and the, what, what happened, indeed, pandemic, the uh, uh, war in uh, Ukraine um, only proved that uh, we only proved us right in a way that uh, this was the, the, the right, the right uh, way to take. Um, minus 55% by 2030. Um, that's that's ambitious. That's actually a scientific goal. This is backed up by by science, and it means, and this is what we're doing at the moment, that we need to reshuffle uh, our all um, all our internal uh, climate uh, policies in order to make it happen. And this probably uh, some some people in the audience are uh, familiar with uh, the debates uh, happening at the moment in the council and in the parliament, but. The, 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 the whole, what we call the Fit for 55 package, is indeed going through the, um, let's say, the, the, the discussions uh, between co-legislators with the, over, the overarching objective of defossilizing uh, our, uh, our economy. And this includes, for instance, a reform of the emission uh, trading system uh, that, uh, of course, we also share with uh, EEA countries such as um, such as um, uh, Norway. So we are basically increasing the emission reduction objective to actually 61 percent. So that's an 18 percent, um, uh, 18 percent objective uh, increase um, compared to the previous uh, to the previous ETS uh, since it entered into uh, into force in 20 uh, in 2005. 
we're removing what we call free allocations, uh, basically uh, uh, emitting uh, emitting allowances that are attributed for free to uh, to to operators, in particular for aviation and in sectors that are affected by the carbon border. Uh, adjustment mechanism, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. And we're also creating a new, actually a new emission trading system in order to enhance efforts in the building and road transport um, and, and road transport sectors. This is for the, let's say, those emissions that are actually regulated by the carbon market, by the EU carbon market. But what happens for the emissions that are not regulated uh, by the, uh, let's say, the other half, so um, roughly, uh, of emissions that are not regulated uh, through the uh, carbon market? Well, those um, are also, the, the, for, for those emissions, um, objectives are also going to be uh, increased. This is what we call the effort sharing regulation. So country by country, what are the uh, specific objectives that uh, are going to go for, for instance, agriculture, uh, that are going to go for buildings, etc. And um, and for uh, what we call in our jargon LULUCF, so the land use and land use change and forestry. Those objectives are also going uh, up with the, let's say, landmark objective, at least for forestry to plant uh, uh, to plant, uh, I think it is, is, it is uh, uh, three uh, billion trees by twenty uh, by twenty by twenty thirty. But beyond this uh, objective, um, it is really making sure that the carbon sink of the uh, of the EU increases dramatically uh, in order to make sure that we don't just we don't just emit less, but we also remove emissions from the atmosphere much, um, uh, much more. Um, also, two essential pillars, traditional pillars uh, of our energy and climate policy, um, the Renewable Energy Directive on the one hand and the Energy Efficiency Directive on the other are also uh, being revamped in order to raise those objectives um, to probably a level that um, few thought was possible only 10 years ago, only five years ago. So we're really uh, uh, squeezing those two lemons um, as much uh, as we can. So up to 40%, for instance, of our energy mix to be covered by renewables by, 20, uh, by 2030 in the um, Renewable Energy Directive. In the transport sector, um, in the transport sector, we're basically um, phasing out, um, uh, let's say, uh, petrol uh, petrol engines by twenty uh, by twenty thirty five. At least these are our proposals. Um, um, boosting for for cars and vans, boosting the uh, alternative infrastructure to make sure that electric vehicles uh, do have um, uh, an opportunity to run smoothly across uh, across the EU. And making sure that both in maritime and aviation uh, fuels that are being used are more uh, are more sustainable. Uh, one essential point as well is making sure that the right that the tax system sends the right signals, and we also have a, a directive for that, the the energy uh, taxation directive, which we're also uh, amending in order to make sure that. Uh, those uh, harm, harmful fuels are taxed more heavily than those that harm the environment, um, the environment less. Um, last but certainly, certainly not least, of course, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that has been extremely, um, uh, that has been at the center of uh, the attention, which basically uh, targets a number of small, relatively small number of uh, carbon intensive products such as fertilizers, uh, cement, um, uh, steel, etc., aluminium, um, that, uh, and, and in particular imports into the EU, making sure that um, carbon leakage is uh, avoided by reflecting, by assist, through a system reflecting the price of the uh, CO2 ton on the ETS for imports of those uh, products. So making sure that indeed carbon leakage is uh, avoided uh, as much as possible. So this is a whole uh, range of, I think, 12 legislative proposals that are going through uh, uh, Parliament uh, and Council uh, at the moment. 
uh, with uh, heated, uh, probably you, you heard about them, heated uh, discussions, including I think last week uh, in the European uh, Parliament regarding the uh, regarding the ETS. So we get we get the uh this um let's say this we're, we're in this moment when we decide about uh the next eight years of uh, economic and social uh, development and of course this uh, this creates uh, some let's say um heated discussions um because this is this is massive this is doable we know it is doable this is why we're doing it but of course uh, it implies a number of uh, trade-offs and it implies a, a number sometimes of, of hard choices um, incredible but true um, the European Green Deal could have been killed right away uh, in March 2020 uh, and a second time in February 2022 uh, not only did it survive those two um, historic moments, but actually these two crises made the European Green Deal only stronger, because at the very centre of the um, of the uh, let's say the uh, recovery plan of the European Union, there is, and in particular, there is uh, next generation EU, the so-called next generation EU program, seven hundred and fifty billion euros. At the very centre of it, there is the Green Deal because this is the kind of money that you spend only once in a generation so of course the choice was made that it was much wiser to invest it in our future rather than in, in our past uh, so 40 percent uh, roughly of the um, of the eu recovery plan is 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 going into let's say eu green deal uh, relevant in eu green deal uh, compatible uh, investment um, for very different reasons the same happened for uh, for the Russian invasion into uh, into Ukraine. Um, the 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 Russian move does not change the uh, destination. It does change, however, uh, a little bit the route that we are taking, and in particular the uh, trajectory that we were thinking to take. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of fossil fuels uh, and fossil fuels in, uh, imports and consumption, considering the weight of Russia um, until February 2022 uh, in our imports of oil, gas, and as well coal, uh, of course we need to we need to sh reshuffle our imports, and this is basically uh, what keeps us busy uh, at the moment. Not me particularly, but my colleagues in the Director General for uh, for Energy. So. Facing out fossil fuel stays as an objective, but we need we need um, we need to rethink the uh, let's say medium term um, and and uh, invest more on reliable partners such as Norway, um, finding new partnerships, uh, and this is also a little bit uh, what we're doing uh, in the uh, Mediterranean uh, at the moment, um, and do it in a hydrogen ready way and this is absolutely critical because the infrastructure that uh, we're going to need uh, in the coming years will need to be um, uh, hydrogen ready because this will be a very important part of the uh, of the answer uh, beyond this the objectives of boosting renewables and boosting energy efficiency uh, uh, remain and they are even more re uh, relevant than uh, than before so where does all this uh, leave Norway? Well, um, of course, the Fit for 55 um, package and all the pieces of legislation under it uh, will need to be translated into the uh, EEA uh, agreement. Um, so we will, uh, implementation of the Fit for 55 um, will probably uh, be delayed a little bit in EEA uh, countries due to how uh, the EEA um, operates, uh, so to speak. So this uh, potentially will be uh, will be a little uh, will be a little challenging also because there is some backlog uh, for the for instance the energy legislation uh, under the uh, EEA uh, such as for instance on the uh, EPBD the European Performance of uh, Building uh, Regulation. So this will uh, need probably uh, thorough work. I would expect in 2023 
and hopefully we'll be able to clear the way uh, relatively quickly. Um, however, Norway remains uh, a very close partner uh, and we're very happy about that and including in what I was talking about this reshuffle of uh, um, medium term let's say uh, fossil fuel uh, imports and we are also very grateful to Norway for the uh, extra effort made in order to help us cope with the impacts of the Russian invasion um, in um, February March um, there are also new opportunities, of course, um, and uh, this is the uh, Green Alliance that you were mentioning, Kasper. Uh, this Green Alliance um, is not necessarily established yet. Uh, randomly, indeed, um, the Norwegian Prime Minister visited Brussels on the 23rd of February, so this really, uh, I mean, the, 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 the calendar clash was unfortunate, but this is, you know, how. Uh, history happens too. This uh, Green Alliance is not established yet, but we, we are working on it um, with uh, perhaps the objective of uh, uh, signing it by the end of the year or early 2023. Uh, we'll, we'll see about that. And I think the document that was released on the 23rd of February mentions a number of uh, topics that are extremely uh, valuable for the future, basically changing the nature of uh, our uh, relationship with Norway, much less based on uh, fossil fuels, much more on indeed um, hydrogen, green hydrogen, um, much more based on raw materials that we're going to need for the uh, transition, including for batteries, for instance, much more based on uh, offshore wind and much more based, of course, on uh, carbon capture and storage where Norway, as we know, has considerable uh, experience and which will be part uh, in one way or another or another of our um, future. Um, so it is inevitable that uh, over the long term our imports of fossil fuels will indeed um, uh, decrease. In the short term, we expect for instance, that, that our gas um, demand will probably remain relatively stable until, until uh, 2030. But indeed, we need to get ready. And this is also the um, meaning of this uh, Green Alliance. We need to get ready for our partnership to change and be more, let's say, future proof and more uh, Green Deal, uh, Green Deal proof. So I would probably stop here because I think I've already been longer than I should have, um, but happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the help. Uh, just as a as, well, note uh, of information for the audience, please use the Q&A function here in uh, Teams if you would like to ask questions. And ideally, um, please pose the questions in English so that all the participants uh, can read them and understand them without uh, assistance of, of Google Translate uh, or that I don't have to translate them um, <laughs> uh, on the go. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Olaf Sandberg uh, from who is a policy officer at the Internal Market Division of uh, EFTA, uh, European Free Trade Association Secretariat in Brussels. Olaf is also uh, well, a very experienced expert, has worked also for some years for the European Commission as well as here in Norway at the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate, NVE. Um, and he will tell us a bit more about, well, Norway's uh, position as an EEA country in this entire setup. Uh, Olaf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and good morning, everyone, also from, from Brussels here. Um, so, so indeed, yes, I work at the uh, Internal Market Division at the EFTA Secretariat and I work with the uh, EFTA Energy and Environment Working Group, where our main focus is uh, to work on the uh, incorporation of EU legislation into the EA agreement. <clears throat> um, now, thinking about the Green Deal sort of from, from the outset, uh, I, I guess you can think about the relationship uh, between Norway and the Green Deal in, in two dimensions. I mean, you have, the, you have the policy or political dimension where uh, elements such as the Green Alliance that Fabian mentions comes in. 
Um, and then you have the rules based dimension and the EA agreement, which is uh, what I'm working on and what we're working on within the <clears throat> within the EFTA structure. Um, so you could you could say that also from from the EU side, the EU is engaging in, both in, in legislative and, and, and non legislative actions and, and the and EU and Norway are also engaging um, along those those dimensions. Um, our role at the EFTA Secretariat um, in within this this frame of the Green Deal is to work on all the legislative actions that are coming as a result uh, of the Green Deal um, and to, to facilitate the process for the EAF the states or by Iceland and Liechtenstein uh, in order to incorporate those uh, legal acts that are EA relevant into the EA agreement. Um, so, so with that backdrop, I think it's it'd be useful if I show some slides uh, to illustrate sort of the uh, the aspects that we are looking at and also the process of incorporation of those uh, legal acts into uh, the EA agreement. Um, looking at from the outset, uh, some of the challenges that we're dealing with uh, coming from um, the nature of the EA agreement itself uh, is that on the one side you have an EU model, on the other side you have an, an, an EFTA model. Um, the EU model is based on uh, supranationality. The EFTA model is based on intergovernmental cooperation uh, without the transfer of competence and uh, with no common policies. For example, uh, in terms of GHG emission reduction targets, there is no overarching EFTA goal for the EA EFTA states. They are individual uh, for each, each member state. Uh, on the EU side, you have the uh, institutions with, with clearly defined roles in the decision making processes, whereas within the EFTA pillar, decisions are taken by consensus between the governments of the EA EFTA states. Um, and uh, for uh, the EFTA states within the EFTA pillar, uh, preserving sovereignty is an important uh, concern. Um, many have probably heard about the uh, two pillar structure of the EA agreement. Um, this is sort of um, what sets out uh, the structure uh, of how we're, uh, we're working um, and also um, you can see that uh, on the left side, uh, in the EFTA pillar, uh, the functions of uh, the EU institutions are uh, are mirrored, and we also have uh, our uh, joint bodies uh, where we meet. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, working on the incorporation of um, of EEA relevant legislation, uh, this uh, occurs in the EEA joint committee. Um, and on our side, we are working under the structure of the standing committee of the of the EFTA states. Um, so under the standing committee of the EFTA states, um, you have so-called subcommittees covering um, the various areas of uh, of the EA agreement. Uh, and within uh, subcommittee four on planking and horizontal policies, you find the field of environment. Um, where we have the environment working group and also within subcommittee one on the free movement of goods, uh, we have the, um, the energy field. Um, I guess um, it's also useful to, to, to sort of illustrate how uh, the processes uh, and on the EFTA side and, and the EU side work and also in terms of, of, of how um, the level of engagement uh, for uh, Norway as an EA EFTA country is within the various stages of, uh, of developing uh, uh, the legislation that is coming under the Green Deal. Uh, so at the proposal stage, um, you have the right of participation of EA EFTA experts into the expert groups uh, of, the, of the Commission, uh, which are working on um, shaping the, the, the legislation that is being proposed. Uh, you have um, influencing uh, aspects where um, we can both set out common EAFTA positions 
um, to the EU. Uh, and also uh, there's, of course, engagement on a bilateral basis from Norway and the other EAFTA states, uh, while the Commission uh, and the EU uh, institutions are, are working on their legislative processes. Uh, once the EU finalizes uh, uh, their uh, institutional processes, it moves over to uh, the EFTA pillar, uh, where uh, uh, we are working within the context of our working groups uh, and with our processes to assess the legislation, um, to assess uh, the challenges, um, and to work towards incorporating them through uh, an adoption in the EEA Joint Committee. Uh, before they are implemented nationally in the EAFTA states. Um, just to uh, illustrate or explain how the process of incorporating uh, legislation into the EAFTA, uh, into the EA agreement uh, works. Um, th this is essentially the process that, that we are working with uh, within, within, within the structure of the Standing Committee and the Working Group. Um, the first step, once the EU has finalized its uh, its its, uh, its legislation, is that the EFTA Secretariat identifies and uh, presents to the EFTA states a preliminary assessment of uh, each uh, legal act in in question. Then the EFTA states, on their side, decide on the EEA relevance of the act and the need for any EEA adaptations. And EA adaptations are essentially um, texts that are written into the so-called EA Joint Committee decision in order to fit a certain legal act to uh, the structure of the EA agreement. Um, then the Secretariat would draft the decision for incorporation. Uh, this would be discussed with the EU, for example, regarding such adaptation texts that I mentioned, and it will finally go to the EA Joint Committee for a decision. Um, when uh, the processes under the EEA agreement are finished, the main, uh, I'm highlighting here the Annex uh, 20 on the environment, um, they go into the annexes uh, of the agreement. Uh, so, um, uh, on the, in the field of environment, uh, we have several uh, chapters under Annex 20. So, you have general environmental legislation, you have legislation on, on water, on air, uh, chemicals, industrial risks, and biotechnology, on waste, uh, and on uh, on noise. Um, in addition, um, there's also uh, the possibility for uh, for the EAFTA states to um, uh, cooperate uh, in areas that are not uh, necessarily considered to be EA relevant. So. Um, I would mention here that uh, the Protocol 31 to the EA Agreement on Voluntary Cooperation, uh, we, for example, had uh, uh, an agreement on extended time cooperation between Iceland, uh, Norway and the EU uh, to take in uh, the effort sharing regulation, the LUCF regulation, and the uh, uh, emission reduction targets outside of the, uh, of the ETS sectors into, into the agreement. Uh, of course, in terms of, of, of other uh, landmark uh, legislation on the EU side that, that Fabian already mentioned, you have the, the ETS, uh, which is in, in, in Annex uh, 20 in the chapter on, uh, on air. Um, and I think that when we're looking at um, sort of what uh, legislation under uh, the Green Deal will apply to the EFTA states, it's of course an important starting point to look at what is already in the agreement. And so I think the bottom line is that the majority of legislation coming out of the European Green Deal are revisions of legislation that is already relevant and already in the agreement. Um, and um, of course the, the, the benefit of the EA agreement and, and, and why it is uh, you know, such a facilitate such a close relationship uh, between Norway and the EU is, of course, that when uh, a legal act is incorporated, then um, Norway will have the same rights and obligations as EU member states uh, within uh, the areas covered by, by that legal act. Um, so I think I will, I will leave it at that. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, we already have some questions here, but I will leave them for for uh, a round after. Uh, we also give Catherine the floor. Um, Catherine Tanne is a professor of law and also head of the Department of Energy and uh, Resources Law at the University of Oslo. Uh, apart from that, she's also a senior uh, research fellow at the Fritjof Nansen Institute uh, in Oslo, or uh, in Lysaker, actually. Uh, she was previously the scientific advisor at the Frisch Center, uh, Oslo Center for Research on Environmentally Friendly Energy, one of uh, elite research centers established uh, here to to um, explore the possibility for sustainable energy transitions. And like two other speakers, she has also worked in Brussels for, for some time, including uh, with the Commission. Uh, Katrin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Casper, uh, for the nice introduction and uh, for the invitation. And I'm talking from Oslo, indeed. I uh, will share my slide um, that I prepared to illustrate some of um, yeah, I guess you can see my presentation. Yes. No, actually. <laughs> no. Ah, all right. <laughs> so let's try again. Uh, it wouldn't be a proper webinar if we didn't have any no. technical problems. <laughs> let's see. Can you see it now? Yes. Right way and full screen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so indeed, I would like to, uh, in the following to illustrate some of the um, points related to the challenges and the opportunities created uh, by uh, the proposals related to the European Green Deal, to uh, the uh, Repower EU for Norway, but from a, a legal perspective. And I would like to address uh, two points. The first one relates to the scope of the legal impacts that it will create for Norway, and the second one on their upcoming challenges and opportunities. <coughs> Sorry. So looking for um, looking at first uh, the impacts of the uh, different proposals under the European Green Deal and the Repower EU, I would like to stress first the question of the uh, scope for it, because when we look at the different proposals under uh, the Fit for 55 package, <coughs> sorry, it builds both on proposals. Uh, <coughs> Catherine, you muted yourself. Just please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so let me know. Also part. So I said, uh, in terms of impact, uh, when we look at the um, scope of the Fit for 55 package, it builds, as was highlighted uh, by uh, the previous speaker, uh, on uh, legislative proposals, uh, legal acts that are already incorporated. Now that means that it will be difficult not to uh, incorporate as well any uh, amendments to those legal acts. At the same time, uh, some of the proposals go beyond uh, those acts and the scope of the uh, normal cooperation under the EU agreement, EEA agreement, and uh, also it integrates several policy areas. So not only energy, environment, but as well agriculture and transport. And that was also highlighted by the first speaker talking about circularity and external dimension. And we know that there are other proposals uh, that will come uh, after the summer, notably in terms of digitalization. And we have the Repower EU package that also deals with security of supply. Uh, that is something falling outside the scope of the EEA agreement. So both things that will probably be incorporated, but as well things that are challenging uh, the EEA agreement. There are a series, when we look at the different uh, legal acts, uh, uh, we can't uh, distinguish between uh, strategic initiatives uh, that build on indeed legal acts that are already incorporated, such, such as the Renewable Energy Directive, the revision of it, because it's a, it 
so only from 2018, but as well uh, the older gas directive uh, that will be expanded to cover hydrogen and uh, decarbonized gases, uh, the EU ETS, uh, non ETS emissions um, to the LUCF or FRT regulation, alternative fuels infrastructure directive. So those legal acts are also extremely important for Norway and are already incorporated through the agreement um, in, in annexes or through the protocol 31, as has been uh, mentioned for non-ETS sectors. But there are also new uh, acts that are proposed that uh, will need to be assessed under the EEA relevance criteria, and that relates notably to the 10E regulation, to CBAM proposal, and uh, the revision of energy taxation directive. So that creates immediate challenges in terms of uh, EEA incorporation. When we look at the uh, process at the EU level, we however, have already some texts that have been adopted and are also extremely uh, impactful on their legislation in Norway. And here I would like primarily to refer to uh, the guidelines, stated guidelines on climate, environmental protection and energy uh, that uh, also have been adopted not only by the European Commission, uh, but as well by um, ESA, EFTA Secret Authority. And that will be an important precedent for looking at uh, the adoption of new um, schemes or uh, individual uh, stated by Norway. And then we have the taxonomy regulation uh, that also uh, is um, in, the, in the phase of implementation. And we have the delegated acts that, however, are still pending. So that means that uh, we have already some uh, legal acts that are already uh, adopted and will have consequences, but we still have ongoing processes. And that raises also a question of consistency when you apply the criteria in the text that are uh, uh, adopted to areas where the legislation in not, is not yet in place. For example, for the guide, stated guidelines uh, that refer to secondary legislation that are not yet incorporated. Finally, when we look at more specifically the Repower EU communication and the Repower uh, EU plan that uh, has been presented in May, uh, we see as well a mix of different initiatives that will impact Norway. The first ones relate to clarification in terms of uh, intervention uh, by the member states in order to address uh, notably high energy prices. So that will be in terms of uh, price regulation, uh, state aids application with more flexibility, design of the support schemes, permitting rules that will be speed up. And here we have a mix of soft law uh, instruments through guidelines, but as well uh, some proposals for hard law. Then we have also a new market intervention initiatives at the EU level that will impact uh, Norway, but the implications are not yet clear in terms of participation notably. We have um, probably on the, on the gas level, the joint purchase mechanism, that is proposed, but as well uh, the EU energy platform, uh, how it will work. And finally, there are a series of proposals in terms of um, contractual provisions, both for the gas contracts, but we also have seen that for the power purchase agreement, we have also some legislative provisions that will influence the drafting of those contracts. And finally, we have an uh, ongoing discussion of what will be uh, the next market design legislation, and that will, of course, impact uh, Norway on the mid and long term. Uh, I put some examples, for example, the batting zone reviews, the, uh, any requirements in terms of transparency on uh, energy transactions. When we look at the second point related to the upcoming legal challenges and policy opportunities, I would like to stress uh, the following. The first one relates to the fact that the European uh, Commission is coming with proposals that are more and more integrated across policy areas and the EU also now operates within the energy union and uh, governance mechanism for ensuring that we are progressing towards the goals of the energy union. This is not uh, uh, the same approach that is followed at the EA level. So I 
highlighted three examples here that shows the complexity of uh, the relationship between EU and the EU process, uh, Norway and the EU processes. The first one is the fact that uh, the European uh, Commission is proposing to have more integrated processes, notably at the planning level, when uh, we have already in the governance mechanisms integrated processes for energy and climate. And now we have indications and this is relevant, this is absolutely uh, right, uh, in terms of integrated planning processes throughout marine spatial planning, energy, climate and transport. So that will uh, bring additional challenges for the uh, manner uh, the Norway is also uh, following on the legislation that is more and more integrated at the EU level. We have the pragmatic approach under Protocol 31 uh, that has been mentioned for a non-ETS sector. Um, Protocol uh, 31 uh, relates to cooperation outside the four freedoms and the question will be uh, how, uh, um, how much can we use, um, use Protocol 31 uh, to that respect. And finally, we have the big question of the backlog. Uh, backlog refers to the acts that are waiting incorporation into the EA agreement and there are different reasons for that. There are long processes for incorporation and as well we have packages uh, that are presented with different acts and that need to be implemented and there are uh, delegated or implementing acts to those mother acts. Uh, so the fact that we are dealing with packages is a major challenge as well in the energy area and if we need to align pro very quickly we may uh, need to single out probably some of these legal acts under the package approach. Another major challenge in terms of legal, um, legal uh, consistency as well uh, is the fact that we find some intermediary solutions that are adopted at national level uh, where we see that there is a separatory partial alignment on EU legislation uh, done by uh, national authorities, but not yet uh, the full incorporation of the legal acts. This creates uncertainty and uh, these uh, probably need to be uh, addressed quickly by probably a, a quicker implementation uh, of some of those acts under packages. And, and here I would like to mention the energy efficiency directive or energy performance in building directive that are a very good uh, example of that. Second, a common challenge that I see is the one of access to EU financing mechanisms for uh, notably the energy transition. We have different mechanisms that are defined in secondary legislation or proposals for uh, secondary legislation that uh, Norway could have access, but the situation will be uh, too, but the situation will be different if it's already incorporated into the agreement or not. For example, the John project under uh, the uh, Renewable Energy Directive, the Union Renewable Energy Financing Mechanism under the Governance Regulation, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, or uh, the PCI uh, project list and the Connecting uh, European Facility. And this happens at the same time that we have ongoing processes for the development of the internal market legislation where Norway is already well uh, associated to. We have uh, grid planning processes with uh, ENTSOE or uh, the association of uh, Norway to the development tenure development plans. We have as well the process for um, at uh, the Norwegian level, national level, um, following up on the network codes, guidelines, terms and, um, and conditions. And and, uh, delegated acts. So this is already ongoing, that's a heavy work. And that also brings the question of the capacity and consistency when you follow up these acts on a national level, both for public authorities and companies. Lastly, and that was something mentioned by uh, Mr. Porsche, uh, is the situation of Norway as a strategic valuable partner to the EU in specific areas. Obvious areas where uh, there will be a common interest and um, as well additional um, value of having Norway as a partner is carbon capture and storage. As we see hydrogen, uh, low carbon hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, but as well low uh, materials value chains as are highlighted by the EU Norway Green Alliance and why not uh, offshore wind as well. Uh, that means that uh, those areas need to be valued uh, in 
EU policies, but as well enabled by the legislation. And we have different examples of where those uh, uh, areas of value chains uh, that are well developed or in the making in Norway uh, were uh, subject to uh, barriers under EU legislation. For example, the manner you uh, define the CCS uh, value chains, operative chain under the EU ETS uh, or uh, under taxonomy regulation, the way we will develop the hydrogen regulation. Having Norway as a strategic and renewable partner means as well that it should be included in, in regional initiative as well. And um, that puzzled many people uh, to see that in the latest um, uh, initiative uh, based on the Esberg Declaration on the North Sea as a green power plant of Europe, uh, Norway was indeed not associated. And finally, uh, I think that it means uh, that no Norway should stay relevant for the EU, uh, that is uh, moving towards more strategic autonomy, uh, while grabbing as well as uh, national opportunities for the country in itself. I'll we'll stop here and welcome any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, a lot of really interesting points there. I would like to, well, pick up on, on some of the issues you said and also some of the questions that are already appearing in the Q&A section and return to Fabien. Um, firstly, um, regarding what um, the, the, the challenges that Catherine has highlighted, especially related to access to EU funds for Norway. Uh, what is what could you say from your perspective on this to what extent uh, is there a possibility for integrating norway into this and what might be the political will in brussels for uh, enabling norway's closer integration and benefiting from from these different financing mechanisms which are well crucial for for this green alliance to to succeed and the second question here from the q and a you have mentioned uh, green hydrogen as an element of the Green Alliance. What about blue hydrogen? Do you think there's still a place for, for that? And what is what is uh, DG Klima's vision uh, for, for this technology? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> well, DG Klima's vision uh, that does not really count. What counts is the, is the European Commission's vision. Um, but um, so first, Perhaps on the uh, on the funding uh, opportunities, um, this really depends, uh, and we have to uh, address this case by case. Um, one major, and here I'm taking my again my sorry for that my DG Klima uh, hat on. Uh, one major opportunity is uh, is the innovation fund. Uh, of course, that uh, basically uh, stems from the proceeds of the uh, of the ETS of the emission trading system, uh, and then goes into funding, um, uh, let's say, uh, opportunities that are relatively close to the market, um, including, for instance, by the way, CCS. Uh, well, uh, Norway has access to uh, this as 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 it should, since it is part of the uh, since it is part of the ETS. So this is a let's say a major uh, avenue, I would say. Um, and then, of course, um, we need to uh, to look at it on a case by case basis. Uh, I don't think there can there can be a general uh, a general approach. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that would be my my answer to this. Um, and on on uh, hydrogen. Um, so I think it has been made pretty clear also uh, through a variety of um, uh, official documents that our preference is indeed green hydrogen. Um, the potential for green hydrogen in uh, a country like Norway is, is, is tremendous considering the uh, energy mix of the country. Uh, not everybody is endowed with 98% of uh, electricity from uh, renewables uh, in the world. So this is an absolutely privileged uh, position uh, which gives really like um, a competitive edge in terms of producing uh, green hydrogen almost uh, almost immediately of course 
we realize that uh, uh, Norway is also probably a little bit of a special case, and in most cases, um, uh, the uh, most competitive option remains uh, fossil fuel-based um, uh, hydrogen, at least for the short term. Um, and and I think there is wiggle room for this uh, to a certain extent. Uh, same way there is wiggle room for uh, there is wiggle room for. Um, for gas in the energy mix. Um, however, of course, um, the one thing that we need to uh, that we need to thoroughly think about is the uh, combination with CCS. I mean, uh, yes, okay, of course, it can be hydrogen can be gas based, but uh, at the very least, I would say uh, it has to incorporate an element of uh, uh, an element of CCS in order to put us in the, on the right uh, on the right trajectory. Um, uh, we will need, uh, and I think this is also made clear in the Repower EU strategy, uh, we will need to uh, import, I think, uh, uh, I, I don't have the number in, uh, in mind uh, any longer, but we will need to import something like a third of um, our, uh, production, uh, of our needs, sorry, uh, from outside uh, the EU. We're working on, for instance, Egypt, um, about this, we're working with we're working on a, a partnership in the Mediterranean on uh, green uh, hydrogen. Um, so it is pretty clear that we will need to rely on our neighbors. Um, hence the uh, opportunity, and um, we will need to rely on our neighbors based on their water and their renewable energy potential. So this is a tricky uh, this is a tricky discussion that we're having at the at the moment. Um, not everybody is in this in this is in the same position and once again Norway is in a very privileged one. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I have one more general question perhaps for for Olaf. Um, the European Green Deal is a very large and all-encompassing set of uh, policy proposals and, and strategies which creates a kind of synergistic uh, governance uh, well um, architecture where different policy areas become connected even though they once were treated as separate to what extent does the the way the eea agreement is constructed, uh, I mean, the, the fact that um, new EU legislation meets already existing um, sets of, um, well, legal areas, as you have shown under Onyx 20, uh, to what extent is this a problem that uh, perhaps those synergies are not so easily transferable into the EEA agreement uh, because of its the, the way it is constructed, you see this as a as a problem, or are there ways for this to be overcome? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a very good and, and, and relevant question. Uh, I mean, certainly the the EU's approach to policy has evolved a lot since the EU uh, EA agreement was uh, was negotiated and, and and signed. However, I think that. Also, an important element is that the EA agreement has a dynamic character, and we have been able to identify um, uh, solutions in, in, in where we have faced challenges um, to, to solve this, this challenge of uh, allocating uh, the correct uh, formal cooperation in relation to the two pillar structure. So, the two pillar structure, of course governs a lot of the approaches that we have we have to we have to take to this um, indeed um, the question of a, of a of a synergistic synergistic governance uh, is, is very very relevant um, I think that um, one of the the challenges here is that of course the EU has its uh, overall uh, common policies common commitments common targets which do not have an equivalent uh, on the uh, on the EFTA side, this is a challenge that that uh, that needs to be uh, needs to be be solved whenever we when we replace them. Um, and um, 
yeah so so when we're looking at uh, at the at the various legal acts um i think that of course it's uh, it's in, important to then be able to to consider those challenges um uh, according to those uh, to those individual uh, legal acts at, at the same time um i mean uh, looking at the structure of the annexes and if, if you bind together um to say obviously uh, EA relevant aspects. Um, I, I think that the challenges are certainly much less. I think it is uh, the challenges are probably more pronounced where you have a mix between uh, areas that are clearly within, for example, the scope of the four freedoms, and you have other elements which are uh, perhaps outside and you bind these together. Uh, and then you have to find solutions uh, in, in terms of in, in terms of how to go forward. Um, I th would just mention uh, that as regards the uh, agreement on extended climate cooperation (ESR) the CF, for example, um, you have uh, a governance uh, that is bound specifically to those legal acts that is uh, placed in in Protocol 31 as regards planning and reporting specifically for the ESR and the CF regulations, which is, of course, a very different approach to what the EU is taking with, with this integrated approach. Thank you very much. Um, two questions for, for Catherine. Uh, one related to this uh, problem of uh, governance regulation not being fully compatible uh, with the way Norway uh, functions in, in its relationship with the EU. Uh, so you, you have discussed some, some examples of how uh, that is um, problematic. And can you also just elaborate a bit more about how do you think, um, well, what can be done from the Norwegian side to um, overcome this problem? And then another thing is, uh, quite complicated question from the Q&A. A lot of acronyms there, I will try, try to unpack them for those who are not familiar with them. Um, how do you consider the risk of backlog in the EEA implementation, in particular where there is incompatibility? For example, where the third energy package provides for NRA, that's uh, National Regulatory Authority Agreements, and the CEP Clean Energy Package for ACER decision. ACER, everybody in Norway knows the acronym, but probably not so many uh, know what it stands for, the Agency for Cooperation of uh, Energy Regulators. Um, yeah, so since you've discussed the backlog problems, uh, perhaps you can also try addressing this one. All right. Okay. You hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks for the questions. The the, the first ones related to uh, governance regulation. Um, that that's something that as well, uh, uh, Olaf Berg uh, uh, pointed out that uh, uh, the EU is in moving towards more integrated approach to the different uh, policy goals. And uh, while uh, Norway is not uh, bind to it, I think that in practice, how to solve that? That's a big question, and and I will be careful. But. Um, we need to integrate more uh, the approaches uh, in for uh, attaining the goals. And uh, the solution that is uh, proposed under the agreement is just to have reporting for, for climate actions because that's based on uh, the legal acts that are incorporated. But I would uh, very much uh, advise towards moving not necessarily as part of the EEA agreement, uh, but at the national level towards more integrated approach, because we need to uh, look at different sectors in a transversal way. And that is something that is promoted under EU legislation, and that also needs to be uh, aligned at the national level. So I think it's a very uh, sensible manner of thinking about development of uh, legislation. Um, so it should must come uh, to be aligned from the national 
national initiatives uh, because there is no requirement as such uh, under uh, the uh, EA agreement uh, to have such integrated approach at that upper level. Also, there are references in secondary legislation to other legal acts, so it will be de facto uh, done. Um, how do I press the risk of, uh, of backload? Uh, indeed, uh, when it comes to uh, the implementation of legislation, there is a real risk uh, of uh, laying behind and that uh, some of the Norwegian actors will not have the same rights <clears throat> than other um, EU actors and that the requirements for the different sectors for example, buildings will not be the same. It could be broader, uh, it could be uh, narrower. So that brings um, a, a consistency uh, on the internal market as well. So here there, there is concrete risk of laying behind, but as well creating barriers for the development of the sectors when we will not have the same legislation national level for the development of hydrogen. Then how are you going to develop the, the, the national legislation? Uh, and if you start developing the national legislation, as some EU states have done on hydrogen, but not being compliant with the uh, Norwegian legislation, because as long as the EU Act is not incorporated, you're not bound by it, then you create additional challenges for uh, as well and, and delays in the development of the project. So there is a, a need to address those uh, issues in, on, on very, very short term. Uh, for not uh, hindering the development of the project. And, and uh, that goes as well, uh, but it's much more technical for uh, the alignment of competences and processes between uh, the uh, clean energy package and, um, and, and uh, cooperation between uh, NRAs and, and ASO decisions. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, they are... Um, yeah, the temporary uh, solution that could be adopted, but what is uh, primarily follow up is a third energy uh, package as it is. That's what is buying. Thank you very much for this, uh, Fabian. There's one question here for you. It's about the taxonomy. Um, just some words of introduction for those who have not followed the debate. The uh, EU sustainability, well, sustainable taxonomy is, uh, well, has been developed for some years. It's a set of guidelines for especially financial institutions and, and business sectors, but also states uh, to, to well, clearly distinguish uh, those investments that can be treated as green from those who cannot. And uh, well, Kathleen has already mentioned the distinction between hard and soft governance tools. There's also this metaphor that some governance tools are like uh, crème brûlée, uh, hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Uh, in a way, the taxonomy is the opposite. So it appears like a set of guidelines, but it will have quite far reaching um, implications. And it's been well, there's there's a lot of controversy around this right now It's going through the European uh, Parliament and the structure here. I mean, the, the question here is what are the prospects for natural gas to be part of the taxonomy after the latest votes in the European Parliament committees for environment and economic affairs? Um, Fabian. <laughs> Well, let's let's make the let's make the, the question even more controversial. What about nuclear then? Um, the this is way above my pay grade. This is not even uh, in the hands of the Commission any longer, as you rightly uh, this uh, as you rightly mentioned. Um, the, the, the delegated act is now going through uh, Parliament, where it is uh, sparking off a number of uh, equally heated discussions. Um, as, as as we are as we are aware um, now i think it's the uh, economic affairs committee and the environment committee uh, voted um, against uh, incorporating nuclear and gas uh, into the taxonomy now the word final word will be with the plenary session i think the vote will take place in uh, in july um, I think not not even uh, MEPs are taking uh, chances about the uh, outcome of this vote. So this is like purely um, uh, a matter for the European uh, for the European Parliament now, uh, considering um, yeah, considering how controversial the matter the matter is. Uh, I think I, I I should not really uh, comment any further. Mm, but can you perhaps just say what happens in, in the hypothetical situation that this gets, uh, well, 
it doesn't it, it's not approved by the by the European Parliament. What happens then? Do you, like, where does it return to and, and uh, what form can the taxonomy take? Because we need some sort of taxonomy. Yes. Uh, then, as far as I understand, I'm 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 not uh, I'm not a sustainable finance expert, but as far as I understand, the it's a yes or a no. So uh, if uh, Parliament says no, uh, we go back to the drawing board basically, um, and uh, this will mean more month uh, and 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 uh, more uncertainty. And this is the uh, key element here, considering the amount of time that we've got left until 2030, the uncertainty for investors is uh, hindering uh, a lot of the projects at the moment. So yeah, the, there is a time element, uh, which is more than time, which is urgency element that we need to take into account here. So um, yeah, the going back to the drawing board versus something that somebody uh, would consider more optimal, et cetera. That's another trade-off that the MEPs have to appreciate. Thanks for this. And I appreciate that you are uh, stepping outside your comfort zone to, <laughs> to, to respond to this. Uh, there are two questions here which are a bit larger, broader, and I think they can be for all of our panelists, whoever feels like they can uh, confront them. One that just appeared. I'll just read it out. Realistically, won't the Ukraine crisis lead to delay in Europe's and Norway's energy transition? If oil industry engaged in new oil fields in Norway um, and they're given ex extraction permits, they will run for 30 plus years. Before the war, pressure was increasing on Norway to stop awarding licenses in new areas. Arguments have changed with the onset of the war, pointing now to the need for more Norwegian oil and gas in Europe. This debate has been very relevant in Norway last year when we had the parliamentary elections and for the first time, this idea of, well, phasing out or at least setting an end date to um, new oil and gas exploration extraction has been explored. I mean, Fabian, you said that both the COVID crisis and then the war in Ukraine have actually strengthened the EGD. Um, but in the relationship with Norway, uh, do you think that the Ukraine crisis has indeed strengthened the, the, the well, extended the life of the hydrocarbons industry? <laughs> yes, uh, this is a very good. This is a very good question, and indeed, um, uh, indeed, uh, a very legitimate one. Uh, however, I want to reiterate here that uh, again, realistically, uh, realistically, I highlight realistically, we're changing perhaps the modalities were not changing the objective. The objective remains defossilizing the European economy. And this is realistic, not just because we can do it, but also because there is, I mean, sorry, but there is no alternative. Tina, uh, almost literally, uh, I mean, I don't need to, you know, emphasize uh, the sort of uh, extreme climate, event, climate events that we're going through at the moment. Um, so realistically, uh, it has to happen. So one way, pre-war or another, post-war. Uh, indeed, now we're in a post-war, um, uh, or, or let's say uh, parallel to war, um, uh, attempt to uh, redefine the route for phasing out uh, fossil fuels over the longer term. Uh, this indeed takes some weeks, some months, perhaps some years in order to figure out exactly where we're going to source the fossil fuels that we still need. Now, uh, Norway, of course, is in a position that is um, uh, very, very particular because it is an extremely reliable um, energy provider to the European Union. It is a very close one geographically, politically, economically. Uh, so interactions are uh, easy. It is, however, also a mature one where uh, extra capacities are relatively uh, relatively limited. Um, so we, as I said, appreciate uh, the um, uh, extra effort made by uh, Norway in order to help us in this um, in this moment that is not necessarily very comfortable. Uh, reshuffling our uh, energy providers, uh, looking for indeed. Um, ways to replace 40% uh, of um, our previous imports 
um, which, as you can imagine, is, is, is really not easy, especially considering the variety of situations that we have across, uh, across the European Union. However, we are doing it. Uh, and again, we are doing it in a hydrogen ready uh, way. Uh, and we're counting on basically all the weapons that we have uh, at our disposal. The, of course, we, we do not want in any way um, to suggest that we're extending the uh, life expectancy of fossil fuels by, do by doing this. It is not the case. Um, and the last thing on earth we want to do right now, because also it would contradict everything we've done until now, would be to suggest that we need to launch new, uh, new fossil fuel projects in order to uh, to meet, let's say, the new requirements stemming from uh, the war in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, as a reminder, and this remains true um, regardless of the war in Ukraine, uh, the International Energy Agency said in a very, very clear way last year that if we are in the energy sector to meet the target of being uh, climate neutral by 2050, then no more fossil fuel projects should be started now. Um, this is this is this is the line we uh, this is the line we hold to, uh, and of course that means I was talking about wiggle room before. So we are really in that in that moment when we appreciate wiggle room. We're not trying to create new capacities. Thank you. Uh, there's also a very interesting and broad question, which I think uh, all of you could, could try commenting on, uh, starting with, with Olaf, to the extent that you, you can, perhaps taking uh, your left hat off and uh, uh, commenting as uh, well an experienced um, political analyst uh, based in Brussels. Uh, how do you or how well, do you structure green partnerships? or green technology cooperation with non-EA countries, what elements from such models, if they exist, may be relevant for an EU-Norway partnership model? So are there any lessons that can be learned from existing um, bilateral or well, cooperation with third countries? And we're thinking, of course, for instance, about the uh, post-Brexit UK or with any other um, countries in, in Europe's neighborhood, something that can be useful for EU a Norway partnership. Yeah, thanks. I actually wanted to jump in a little bit uh, on uh, on what what the previous uh, question uh, mentioned, also on, on fossil fuels. Um, I'll take off my my EFTA secretary hat a little bit, um, but also, I mean, I would say that as a partner to the EU, as an important energy nation. Um, and given that the EA agreement provides such a high degree of legal certainty on so many important areas, and, and given the extent of this cooperation, that from the outset puts Norway in a different uh, sphere than, than, than I would say all the other ener major energy importers that the EU is dealing with. And um, for me, this should also provide a longer term basis for 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 how this uh, trade and energy products does happen between between Norway and the EU. Um, of course, I guess even in the even in the 2050 uh, net zero uh, scenario, there will be uh, some consumption of of certain fossil fuels. Uh, that's inevitable, um, and I and I think that given you know, the commitments that are taken um, by an EEA at the country uh, like Norway, the certainty this provides on, on emission reductions, uh, on, uh, on, on, on governing um, the energy uh, sector more broadly and, uh, and, and the climate commitments. Uh, this provides a very good basis for this type of long-term cooperation between EU and Norway, which, which sets it aside from I would say other other major energy exporters. Thank you. Um, and uh, Catherine, 
do you have any thoughts on uh, the lessons that can be learned from from other partnerships for Norway EU relationship? And also, there was a question here about the possibilities for Norway to well take advantage of opportunities inherent in the European Green Deal uh, in a way as apparently some uh, EU countries are already doing. I mean, are there also areas uh, that can be well, organize better in this area. How do you? What, what's your uh, impression as an energy expert? Uh, that's a very uh, uh, relevant question. How do you structure these green partnerships? Uh, and we have many examples of that during the past few years. Uh, uh, how you can have just a memorandum of understanding or something much more binding. I think what is crucial for making them real is to have a good dialogue with the companies that it is really based on concrete value chains on concrete projects uh, that will enable the accomplishment of the goals. I think the, the example of CCS in Norway is an excellent one because the companies have been working on concrete projects. They have been more open on cooperation because they knew that they needed to work together. Uh, would it be for digitalization, uh, data sharing, uh, technologies, etc across borders uh, as well, and uh, that was backed up by a commitment at the national and uh, uh, bilateral level. I think that's the only, the only way to be concrete in the implementation of those uh, uh, green partnership is to identify where there is uh, an opportunity for, for partnering, but as well having a very close dialogue between the national goals, uh, mutual interest, and then uh, the companies implementing those projects. So that 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 was one uh, one point that uh, I wanted to make. And and on the uh, on the previous question of the delay for uh, the energy transition, because this is this is so important as well for the way of developing further the energy policy in Norway. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, the, the government has been uh, developing as well uh, new criteria in the light of the uh, different cases uh, in Norway um, and related to uh, the, the exploration licenses that will also be binding on the assessment of new uh, award. So that's something that is already in a way structuring uh, the, the, the way of assessing any new um, award of licensing. And, the, and there is uh, some recent examples uh, and, and lately on the award of um, APA rounds as well. And the way that uh, this is not uh, 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 opening up uh, Pandora box and and Norway has also said that uh, they are already exporting uh, at the maximum at the moment. Uh, so it's not just a question of asking Norway to increase volumes. There are contracts, there are companies, there are operatorship elements in it. Uh, so this is part of the, of the, 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 the bigger picture. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, Fabian, do you have any reactions? No, I think uh, this is um, this is um, this is extreme. These are extremely valid points. I would, in particular, perhaps um, echo uh, what Catherine just uh, said on the uh, uh, let's say the, the the way to structure uh, green uh, green alliances or green uh, partnerships. When we talk about a green alliance, um, we have to realize that um, this is a very specific, let's say, climate diplomacy uh, instrument that we have used in the EU only once with Japan. Um, so it is uh, not for everybody. It is for uh, countries whom we assess share the same or a um, equivalent uh, level of ambition. Um, and that already in itself uh, says a lot. I would really uh, second what Catherine said on the need to support it with a valid uh, business dialogue uh, across uh, across the board and across both sides. This is, for instance, what we have with Japan. We have an extremely strong uh, business dialogue, very valid one, uh, really all encompassing. Um, on in, including, for instance, on what I was talking about uh, at the very beginning of this uh, of this discussion on 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 eco design, on uh, resource efficiency and circularity. This helps a lot. It really helps a lot having businesses uh, on board. Now, in the case of Norway, 
um, I think one critical element indeed will be strongly industrial uh, in this uh, in this green alliance, and almost by definition it has to encapsulate a very strong uh, a very strong business dimension. So um, I would definitely uh, I would definitely second that, and I hope will be will be able to uh, to make it happen. Um, in my view, it also has to uh, incorporate um, an element as precisely of, of let's say, multilateral uh, climate diplomacy, uh, and that is absolutely critical because uh, the EU and Norway also share ambitious positions in multilateral uh, in multilateral fora. Both the EU and Norway are important contributors to climate finance flows uh, globally, so. This also has to be um, has to be reflected in this uh, because that's that's also another very concrete way of making our partnership stronger. Thank you very much for this one uh, interesting question that just appeared um, again, probably to you, Fabian. Uh, would the Commission be open to including energy saving and circular economy in the bilateral agreement? And in order to avoid the battery tariff, could Norway become a member of the EU Customs Union? So perhaps Fabian and, and Olaf uh, have thoughts on this. Um, yeah, well, the, on the Customs Union, it's really not for me to uh, really not for me to uh, to assess. Uh, it's uh, one one critical element, of course, is that since uh, Norway shares the ETS uh, with um, with the EU. Uh, Norway is not covered by the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, so that already lifts a number of, uh, let's say, uh, concerns. Um, the other question was on uh, energy savings and circularity. Um, I think it, it, for me at least, it almost goes without saying that those two are pillars of climate action, not just you know uh, elements of policy in 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 themselves. I think it has been proven that uh, circularity can unlock basically a half of the emissions, let's say mostly indirect emissions that we would not be able to abate um, should we not adopt the right policy incentives, the right tax incentives in terms of precisely uh, circularity. So this is absolutely critical, and in terms of uh, energy efficiency, as we usually say in the uh, in the EU, and probably not only in the EU, it's the first fuel uh, that we need to uh, that we need to activate uh, even before uh, renewable energy. Then, of course, um, it is a complex legislation uh, in. Um, in the EU, and it is, as rightly pointed out, uh, one where the, the issue of the backlog uh, applies uh, particularly strongly. So uh, how we will go about it is probably way too early to say, but uh, in principle, yes. Thank you. There's also uh, another question that appeared. Why should e Norway and you have a bilateral agreement when we are fully integrated into the internal market? Uh, I guess this comes back to the distinction between the political dimension, the rules based dimension that, that Olaf mentioned uh, earlier. Um, so, yeah, why should Norway have a bilateral relationship uh, with the EU if it's already an EEA uh, country? Is that a question for me again? Uh, it's a question for you and Olaf, I guess, uh, and also a final one almost because we we only we only have three minutes before we have to finish. Yeah, I think uh, well, it is it is a valid one. Uh, it is a valid one indeed. We're we're very closely aligned uh, and we're very closely integrated, as we can see, not necessarily entirely, but uh, very closely. That's for sure. However, um, what we can see today is that um, there is a need, and here again, I'm going to refer to the internal international energy uh, agency. Uh, report on net zero by uh, by 2050. There is a need for a very a stronger than ever policy push, on the one hand, and on the other hand for international cooperation. One very 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 clear conclusion that the um, IEA put on the table last year is that without international cooperation, we won't make it. Uh, we we really won't make it. Uh, so 
of course, um, can we cooperate more? Obviously, here, I think there is a shared feeling between the EU and Norway that indeed we can cooperate more because there are fields of opportunity. I mean, we didn't mention even green shipping today, but I mean, this is another one, another relatively obvious uh, one where there are still low hanging fruits that one way or another, one way or another, the single market did not, didn't necessarily uh, uh, grasp yet. So yes, uh, we can be even, 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 even closer. And I think this green alliance can uh, uh, help address a number of these still low hanging fruits. Thank you very much. Um, last and final question that appeared here. It's a bit off topic, uh, but I think it's it's worth asking still because it's not about Norway, it's about Ukraine. And you might have heard yesterday uh, it was announced that Ukraine will join the International Energy uh, Agency, uh, which is, is a big uh, step. Uh, can a green alliance of a similar kind that uh, EU and Norway have work for integrating Ukraine into the Green Deal? So I guess this is for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, OK. Um, to a certain extent, um, I think the discussion for Ukraine uh, does not uh, really take the same route as the discussion for, for Norway. Uh, at the moment, as uh, you probably know, we have uh, three pending applications to the EU. Uh, so uh, from from Georgia, uh, Ukraine and Moldova. So this uh, reshuffles things quite considerably uh, and does not even uh, put the, um, uh, let's say, the emphasis on, on whether we should have a green alliance with them uh, or not. Um, this being said, of course, one element still of the Green Alliance is, I mean, there are a number of criteria. It's a little bit like becoming a member of the uh, of the EU. There are a number of criteria to, to be met um, in order to, uh, to have a Green Alliance with the EU. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it is, um, it, it is difficult to say that uh, Ukraine, uh, pre-war Ukraine, uh, met them. So, but that of course does not mean that we're not interested in having uh, a, a stronger than ever and greener than ever partnership with uh, with Ukraine as part of the Eastern Partnership uh, uh, with Ukraine as a uh, candidate uh, country or not. Uh, so, of course, this is this is a um, discussion and this is a, a, a field. That goes, in my view, way, way beyond what uh, a Green Alliance can achieve. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks to, to all three of you today, and thanks to all those who have been uh, asking questions or, or watching the streaming uh, at NEPI's website. Um, well, it was a pleasure. And of course, we, we covered a lot of ground, but there's still a lot to uh, left to discuss. So I hope we we can meet again at some point later. But meanwhile, uh, I will wish you a, a really good summer and um, thank you very much again. Thank you.